So today we have Tommy Tapner here from the National Wildlife Federation. Uh, he's the data strategy lead, um, and he uh, develops business intelligence solutions for both fundraising and program applications. And prior to joining the uh, National Wildlife Federation, Tommy served as the development director at the uh, Chelsea? Chesla, Chesla. <laughs> uh, Foundation, where he marketed and raised funds to support documentary films. And he also received his master's in arts management and bachelor's in fine arts from George Mason, George Mason University. Um, also, there is the surveys on your guys' table. You guys should have gotten those. If you don't, don't worry. I have plenty of extra. You can grab one at the end. Also, there is a session handout. So if you didn't get a chance to get that, um, let me know, and I will run those around to you guys, okay? So if you guys can just raise your hand if you didn't get one of those sessions. Okay, let's move to that. Perfect. Okay, I will bring them around. Thanks. All right. Well, look. Uh, Thank you guys for uh, for coming to see me today, and um, I'm really glad to be able to hear, be here and uh, talk with you. Um, it is true that, that I do work on on uh, what I call business intelligence solutions, um, but in essence, you know what I do is is I identify problems and then I find solutions for them, um, which is was really what what analysis and business intelligence is about. So that's what, that's what we all do, and and really that's what what nonprofits do is they they identify problems and then they make it their mission to to solve them. Uh, so the subject I want to discuss with you today is is about taking that same kind of drive, that same kind of passion, and applying it uh, to the way that we work. Um, I want to do that through the subject today, specifically of automation uh, and workflow automation. And I don't know about you guys, but when I hear the term workflow automation, uh, having you know worked with data for a while and worked with a number of data vendors, uh, that term immediately sounds expensive to me. <laughs> uh, but, but the truth is, it doesn't have to be. Um, more and more, there are tools out there either that you already have or that are freely available uh, or available to low cost that can do uh, the same work if you just uh, you know, apply a little creativity, a little ingenuity, and, uh, and have a desire to learn. Um, in fact, uh, anyone who was in uh, Chris Mary's session on uh, free open source tools just before this one across the hall will know that they're just abundant solutions uh, to fill every single gap. So before I dive in though, I want to tell you a little bit more about uh, NWF and about the, uh, the way we're organized so you have some context. So um, we, we are one of the oldest conservation organizations in the US. Um, a lot of our work uh, and what we're best known for is education work and children's publications, specifically Ranger Rig. Uh, but we do a lot of uh, on the ground advocacy work as well um, and, uh, and work with a variety of different groups. In fact, uh, our, our kind of what you might consider our value proposition is uh, bringing together different audiences from hunters and anglers to garden clubs um, to educators, uh, you know, to even you know, lawyers and policymakers. What that means really is, is that we have a vast diverse constituency and, uh, and it makes analysis work both more important and more difficult. From a technical standpoint, we're actually in the midst right now and we just a couple of months ago completed a transition to uh, a unified analysis team. Uh, previously we had analysts located in different business units around the organization um, and we've created what uh, is known in the industry and, and what we're calling a business intelligence competency center. Uh, basically it means it's, it's a little bit like a collective. Uh, you all get together and you work on solving solutions and you, you compile your knowledge together so that you, you can learn from each other. But you may not be organized strictly as a team. You're still kind of embedded within individual business units. Um, we are also a uh, an entirely Microsoft-based shop, so all the tools that we use um, from uh, our database, which is SQL Server, to, um, uh, to our web server, uh, which is all.net, is, uh, is Microsoft. Uh, what that means is that the examples you're going to see today are, are based on that. They're, they use Microsoft tools in combination with um, free and open source software. But what this talk is not really about, it's, it's not about tools, per se. Uh, it's, it's really about how you think about tools. 
So uh, nothing here uh, is restricted just to the tools. It can be applied to, to a wide variety of situations to other tools. Uh, so just to give you a sense for anybody who isn't familiar with, with SQL Server and how it's set up and the tool set around it, um, it it's all based around a database, uh, the SQL Server database, but then there's a, an environment around it uh, that provides the common services. So you have um, down at the bottom SQL Server integration services. This is your ETL tool. Um, it's uh, sort of a visual workflow design tool uh, that takes in raw data, manipulates it, um, and spits it out. Um, and up at the top, you have SQL Server Reporting Services, which is obviously a reporting platform. Um, and there's a, this additional component, SQL Server Analysis Services, which is what, how, how you design uh, BI um, cubes, BI applications in SQL Server environment. So obviously, with a name like SQL Server, um, SQL is pretty critical to it. Uh, and as, as a quick show of hands, how many of you here work with SQL, the language, on a regular basis right now. So good. So some of this is going to be pretty basic, so I, I might skip over it. But um, to me, SQL is the most important investment you can make when it comes to working with data. It's the lingua franca of databases. Uh, there are different dialects, but uh, broadly, it's the same. Uh, and there are a couple of things that you need to know within that. So uh, you know, you're know, going to know this, but uh, you work with select and update statements. Within that, you do joins. Um, to make your data really useful, you need to know a few other things like uh, subqueries and case statements. And so I'm going to show a few examples really of how I use those to transform data as I select it uh, so that what you get out is actually data that's already partially or fully prepped. So these are, this is a case statement. Uh, Case statements basically allow you to select a piece of data and then transform it as you select it. Um, in this case, I'm actually taking a single variable, uh, gender, and converting it into two binary variables just by selecting on a specific case of gender, male in one case as a one, gender as a um, female in the other case. Um, well, this is a very simple example. You can get a lot more complicated than this. You can do it with lists. Uh, you, can, you can even select based on, on values, dollar values. You can use that to turn a continuous variable like uh, gift size into uh, a categoric, categorical variable like gave a gift between $100 and $500. Going a little bit deeper, the next thing is subqueries. Uh, subqueries you can think of as a query within a query. So in this case, I'm selecting the constituent ID. And by the way, these are, these are genericized examples. So um, uh, it's possible that some of the, the formatting and syntax may not be great, because I was trying to simplify them to fit them on the screen. Um, I'm so selecting the constituent ID, and then I'm selecting something else. And what I'm selecting is actually another query. Um, a few important things to note in here. If you look under the, the where statement in the second query, I'm associating the constituent ID in the gifts table with the constituent ID in the constituent table. Uh, this is important because um, what it shows is that this is actually a truly independent query. Um, subqueries are not automatically related to the queries outside of them. Uh, if I had, didn't have that field in there, I would get all the gifts in 2012 from everybody. Um, well, it may seem like most of the time, you actually want to, to put together a query that's related to the constituent, the adder <coughs> query, you can actually use this feature to, to be creative with this. So for instance, if I didn't just want all of the gifts this constituent made in 2012, maybe I wanted the average of the gifts given within that constituent zip code. I could do that with subqueries. Uh, so moving from SQL, that was just a quick overview, um, into how we then use that in some of the tools around SQL Server. Um, this is a, a fairly simple example of using SQL Server integration services um, to build a workflow that actually does uh, analysis work for me. So what this is actually doing is it's taking a, um, an engagement score that I built and it's calculating the score for me in a workflow. 
so really quickly, I'll, I'll walk you through this to give you a sense of, of uh, how this works. So up the top, you have involvement data and giving data. Uh, those are actually two queries, uh, each pulling from the same database, but pulling different data. Uh, if we look closer at the giving data query underneath it, you'll see what it's actually doing is it's using subqueries, in fact, 10 separate subqueries to select um, a value for each year for the past 10 years. And um, it's using, it's returning for every year that it finds giving, it's returning a, a point value that decreases from the most recent year to the past year, plus something else, in this case, uh, the log of, of the uh, average of the gift. It's not really important why I do that. It's, um, it was just, it was part of the, the score. But if we go back to our, uh, our overview, I'm doing a similar thing with involvement data. And so I'm pulling out data that's already partially selected for me. Instead of pulling out the gift, I'm pulling out a point value that says, if this person gave in 2012, they get 500 points. They gave in 2011, they get 250 points, and so on. Uh, the involvement side, I'm doing the same thing, except I'm looking at constituencies. Are they a board member? Are they a member of our legacy society? And if I find those values, uh, I assign them points. So going down really quickly, um, once we get the scores out, in the aggregate, what I'm actually doing is adding up those two scores, sorting them, and then finally merging them into a single table. And then the next thing is replacing missing values. That's actually taking anybody who didn't receive a score. Because try, you know, no matter what I do with, uh, with SQL queries, I'm going to end up with, uh, with people in there that have no score at all. And it assigns zeros to any of those people. Finally, it adds up all the scores into a single combined score. And then the conditional split, it's splitting off anybody that had a score of zero and just leaving me with people with an actual score. And finally, sending it out to a flat file, a CSV in this case. So that was a quick overview of, of using C, uh, SQL Server Integration Services. And we're going to come back to this a little bit later. But uh, now I want to talk a little bit about using scripting languages in addition to this. And, um, and then we'll talk how we can combine these together uh, into a, uh, an environment. Um, so this is a fairly simple uh, R example. And you know, if, if you're not an R user, um, you don't need to be able to read this. Uh, but, but basically what it's doing is it's taking a list of addresses and it's finding congressional district using freely available census data. Um, it takes the, the congressional, or the address, geocodes it into latitude and longitude, and then it finds what congressional district that address is in. Uh, what's useful to note here is that you know, there's all this data out there on, on the web, and much of it is, is freely available. And if you just put a little time in, you can, uh, you can use that to get some interesting um, variables in your data. Uh, sorry, give me just a moment here. <clears throat> so here's another uh, R example. In this case, uh, we're actually looking at internal data, but um, and we're selecting a, a variety of uh, demographic variables out of an existing database. So this working a little bit in the other way, uh, I'm actually combining SQL with R um, and using uh, R to transform a list of, at the top, what is a list of uh, IDs for constituents um, and formatting it properly to select in the, in the SQL table. And then I'm outputting it and, uh, and assigning it to a, a table. <clears throat> so, um, now we'll talk about something that's a little bit more interesting. Uh, in this case, we're looking at, P at PHP script. Um, you know, PHP is a really useful language to have. It's um, among the languages that, that are part of my tool set every day, along with R uh, and a little bit of Python and others. Um, these languages, they all have different, uh, different strengths and weaknesses. For instance, uh, R and Python have really good libraries for um, statistics and for uh, financial analysis. PHP and Python are, are better at um, working with web data, working with uh, strings and text data and things like that. 
So um, I'm actually using this to, uh, to scrape web data. In this case, and I'm actually using it um, based on data that was previously scraped. So what I have is I have a list of um, schools in the New York City public school system. And uh, it's reading in the list of IDs, um, going to uh, a page that contains their financial information, downloading the entire page, and um, searching for the one phrase that shows their FY12 budget amount. Um, what I'm able to do with this then is combine it with demographic data I have in the school about the population uh, and also information about the neighborhood, um, such as home values and things like that, to, to return a dollar spent per student and compare that with the demographics to see if there's any correlation between school spending and, uh, um, and the, the neighborhood. Uh, an important note about uh, grabbing web data, especially in light of the, uh, the security talk this morning, is um, there's nothing illegal about scraping web off the data. Uh, however, it is um, against the terms of service of many websites. So before you start working on any kind of a web scraping application, uh, doing anything really with, um, with working directly with web data, with HTML, uh, you should read the terms of service of the source just to make sure that um, you can't get banned from the site or uh, cause any legal trouble for your organization. So uh, one final example in the scripting languages area, um, going back to R this time, uh, this is an example of using um, a scripting language to actually generate your own variables based on other data. Um, so in this case, once again, we're working with um, with schools and addresses, but uh, I was using uh, the latitude and longitude of, of two places, in this case a park and a, uh, um, and a school, to find out what the closest park was to a school as a measure, measure of um, how much outdoor access kids had, how green their neighborhood was, um, how urban it was, things like that, uh, which gives us a, a good sense of uh, um, how much exposure the child might have to, to just the outdoors in nature. Uh, and then finally, uh, this is a, a recent example that I think uh, would be you know, something that's useful to everybody. Uh, in this case, I was, I was asked to analyze uh, our acquisitions program and discover over a series of, of months direct mail campaigns um, which vendor models we had been using that were the most effective. Um, so I, I, select, I uh, requested the original mail files from uh, our mail vendor, and what I received back were six months worth of files, each of which was at least a gig in size, um, and uh, contained millions of rows um, and uh, hundreds of columns. Uh, even worse, they were in a uh, uh, fixed width format. So. Um, I, had, I only had one program that could actually even open the file to look at it for visual analysis. Uh, so the first thing I could do before I did any work was I had to transform the file into a more useful format. So this program has only one purpose. It opens up a file, a flat file in this case. It reads the file line by line, um, and it grabs out the actual columns based on their positions in the fixed width format, converts that line into a CSV file, and then spits it out into another file. Uh, by doing this, I was able to convert files that were a gig in size down to a few hundred megabytes, uh, reducing their, their size by about 80%. Um, and because of that, I was able to not only load uh, the files into R for analysis, but I was actually able to load all the files into a single um, variable with about 9 million rows in it uh, so that I could analyze it across all the mailings at once. Uh, that just wouldn't have been possible without converting the files first. So you know now that you you know you have all these scripts you have they do a variety of things um, you know this talk is about automation so far we haven't automated anything uh, so how does this all fit together well automation is actually fairly simple to do um, it's it's really just the act of of taking something that you want to do and passing it off to a process that handles the work of doing it at the right time for you. Um, at the kind of phase one of this, you can really use tools that are provided not even just by your server environment, but 
by your operating system. Um, in this case, uh, Windows Task Schedule Scheduler, which has been part of uh, you know Windows since uh, '95, uh, is actually very good at taking a given script, uh, a given program, and running it based on a trigger, whether that's a certain time of day, or whether it's a certain time of week, or whether it's uh, an act like logging in. Um, to do this, all you have to do is, is run a program from the command line. So here's just a few samples of what, uh, what that means exactly. It's, it's really the standard format of running the original program, whether it's R, PHP, or an SSIS package, um, followed by the name of the actual file. Uh, in the case of, uh, of SSIS, you do have to have it in package, and in some cases there are a few extra variables, but overall it's pretty simple. Uh, you can then extend this by using uh, batch files, which are really just um, text files with command line um, calls in them. Uh, that allows you to get a little bit more granular by um, scheduling the order in which things happen, or creating a series of commands. For instance, if you had um, an SSIS package that pulled data out of a warehouse, and put it into a file, and then our program that picked it up, um, analyzed it, maybe ran a regression analysis and spit out results, and then uh, another um, SSIS package that picked up that, uh, transformed it, and put it into a database. So the next layer of automation is, is really combining your tools directly uh, within themselves. Uh, in this case, we're returning to the um, SSIS example that I showed earlier, uh, but with a different view. The uh, calculate scores uh, box at the top there is actually a higher level view of the, um, the set we looked at before. Uh, in this case, it's a, it's a data flow task. Uh, and we're looking at the control view, which basically means what order do things happen. Um, data flow tasks are where the, the majority of data processing happens. So what we're doing here is we are taking the scores we produced in that first and passing them off to something. Uh, in this case, it's actually a, a command task that runs a, um, a Windows executable. Uh, so I can pass the results of that calculate scores onto an R script that may then take them and perform some kind of analysis on them, regression analysis, what have you, before passing them off to another function that did something else. In this case, um, ranking them into deciles. Uh, using a, a very handy uh, SQL function called Entile. Uh, and then this is uh, my, my final example in the uh, uh, automation mode, and this is what you should consider a, a very exa uh, advanced example. Um, this is using uh, um, stored procedures in SQL. Uh, these, if, if you don't have experience with stored procedures, you can think of them essentially as a collection of uh, SQL commands or even other uh, languages, um, .NET languages, put together into a, uh, a program on a um, server that you can then call against as if it were a table uh, or an object in your server. Um, and this is using a feature called uh, XP command shell that you'll see down at the bottom there. What this allows us to do within a stored procedure um, or within a SQL call is actually pass variables from the SQL call as we select them into a Windows executable like R or like PHP or like SPSS, whatever your chosen program is, which can then take those variables, analyze them, and uh, spit out results. So taking the, the kind of granularity down a level, this then lets you do everything in, in a single file. Now the reason I said it's, it's very advanced and uh, going back to this, this security question, um, you know, ser these servers are set up meant to be accessed remotely. And uh, you know, very few server owners want people to have the ability to, to run a uh, Windows command line, uh, command script from within uh, SQL. Um, it's very easy to use that for nefarious purposes. So uh, this only exists, uh, or this is actually disabled by default and requires admin privileges to turn it on. Um, and even then, if you're going to use it, it, it requires fairly strict controls over who has access to it and what programs they can run. So lastly, very quickly, I wanted to talk about uh, reporting, just because 
you know, once you, you've got your data analyzed, you've got these scripts running for you, you know, a lot of the work's being done, um, how do you then share it? Uh, I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail with this just because there's a number of great sessions uh, already here today. In fact, there's one right after lunch specifically on SQL Server reporting services. Um, but, but I did want to talk about, uh, you know, for those who may not be familiar with it, what you can do. This is a very simple example. This is really just reproducing the output of an Excel document. <clears throat> um, but once it's created, this could then be served up through, uh, through its own built-in web server, or it can be embedded in your existing intranet or SharePoint site, um, or a variety of other sources, or even scheduled to, to uh, mail as a PDF or other document on a regular basis. So um, that's really uh, the end of the presentation for me. For, for this, it was, I, I really didn't want to share specific tools so much as I wanted to share, um, maybe inspire you to think about the tools that you have a little bit differently um, and, and go looking at for other tools and uh, um, you know, maybe find ways to automate the work that you're already doing uh, so that you can focus your time on, on uh, other areas. So that's it. So did we have any questions? We'll wrap up. We're uh, a little bit early, so go off and get in the lunch line early. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so what's that one video of SSR so what does say to your RS report? Sorry, what was that? What's that one video of using SSR so what does say to your RS report? Instead of putting all the R completely, you're putting all the the ability to, to share and the ability to make it part of your native environment. Um, there are some examples actually out there of combining uh, some of the things that R can do that SBSS, or that, sorry, SRS can't do, um, like box plots and like producing plots based on regression analysis. They use that XP command shell to actually insert an image from R into um, uh, an SS, SRSS report. But um, it's mostly just that there's a, uh, there's a visual environment for developing SSOS reports. Um, there is a built-in web server component, so it's instantly accessible to the people you make it accessible to. Um, and uh, it's also, it's more user-friendly. For instance, if I were to share an R report, I've got two options. I can either spit it out into an image or a PDF and share it that way, or um, I can give it to somebody else who has R installed. But um, SRSS doesn't require those, those options. Anything else? What were the biggest uh, you know, operational improvements you saw as a result? Of yeah. What was the problem that really inspired you to seek this solution? Mostly it's just the, um, the pure amount of time it takes to prep data and to define the data, to get it into the right format so I can analyze it. You know, about 70% to 80% of analysis, I would say, is just data prep. It's just cleaning the data and scrubbing it. Um, so I found once I had these collection of scripts, um, if I knew I was going to be doing the same analysis on a regular basis, why not just have the scripts run in the background when I wasn't working on them? So the data is already available to me. It's already prepped for what I want. So I can, I can take the time on the analysis rather than spending the time just converting data. Okay, well thank you very much. <laughs>